Apple Knocker Radio. Okay, greetings, friends. I've spent the last couple of months, really, picking through a book titled Mind War by Lieutenant Colonel Michael Aquino. Uh, I was really trying to understand it, like really grasp exactly what he's saying. And, and in philosophical terms, that was relatively easy. But the actual impl- the actual implementation of the system was kind of complicated. And I, I'm at the point now where I think maybe I'm confident to say it's not my inability to understand. I think Aquino doesn't adequately explain one key part, um, which is the thing I've been wrestling with. And I'm at the point I'm just done wrestling, man. I, I've, I've got too much to do. And um, but this has been a worthwhile experience. Let me be clear. This has been a worthwhile experience. So I'm going to get into I'm going to get into what is what is mind war, man? What is it about? What is this book about? Before doing that, let me give the usual caveat. I am aware of the controversy surrounding Lieutenant Michael Aquino. I have no opinion about it because I haven't looked into the evidence. I, I don't come to opinions about people's guilt or innocence of anything until I look into evidence myself. But the reason why I haven't looked into evidence is because it's not important to the purposes of me reading this book and trying to understand it. Whatever Aquino may or may not have done in his personal life, um, he was a high-ranking military officer. So I was just trying to understand, um, and not only was a high-ranking military officer, he was somebody who's very much stood out from the normal military officer, right? So I assume he had he had to be, on some level at least, an influential figure, right? An original thinker in that sphere. And so I'm trying to understand um, what exactly his influence might have been and and I have a personal interest in psychological warfare psychological psychological operations um, general psychological manipulation hypnotism all of those subjects I just find them interesting and um, and so I just I wanted to understand this right and so whatever the deal is with Aquino's personal life is irrelevant to my trying to understand this book trying to understand mind war okay that caveat out of the way <clears throat> all right the biggest surprise about mind war for me When I initially stumbled upon the book, I assumed that Mind War was like next level psychological operations, right? Like, you're going to take this thing even further to to, to mass, mass brainwashing on a level that's never been seen before. But that's not actually what the book says. It's not even close, actually. I think the most surprising thing about the book is that Mind War is essentially a proposed alternative to traditional warfare, which Aquino... Um, identifies as physical warfare um, but uh, that is a little surprise but what surprised me even more is that Aquino or this I'm going to refer to it as this book this book also it um, it makes clear I don't I wouldn't say it condemns or denounces psychological operations and traditional psychological warfare but it it definitely criticizes it on a moral basis, right? It, it lumps traditional psychological warfare in with physical warfare. And the book really, it's really in, in two parts, right? There's um, like kind of a hypothetical, philosophical, um, ethical criticism of warfare, an analysis of warfare. And then the second half is in, in that part was the, the one that I found easiest to mull over and think about and comprehend the second part is um a kind of a broad overview on how mind war would actually be conducted and that is where i felt um it's it's entirely possible that i'm just not grasping something that's obvious but i don't think so i i really think aquino left some gaps in this book leaves some gaps in um explaining what um how exactly this mind war would be conducted, right? And I'll get into that in a little bit. But, okay. So the book is largely, a good portion of it, is um, an ethical and moral analysis and criticism of traditional warfare, physical warfare, and psychological operations. Um, Kind of at the core of the book, uh, from an ethical standpoint, is that um, individual sovereignty is uh, paramount. And so, therefore, manipulating them through psychological operations is unethical, just as unethical in the perspective of this book as physical warfare, you know, just as unethical as killing them. And that's interesting. I did not expect that to be true. Um, Now, the book does say that... Okay. When you get to the actual implementation of the mind war, 
No, no, I want to stick to the analysis for a little bit because there's some really there there are some really quality stuff in this. Now I made a previous video about this. The biggest thing, the thing that I've been mulling over, I've actually, I have to admit, this book there was um there is something that I have not been able to stop thinking about, and I'm actually going to um, start doing a I'm going to add a series onto my channel inspired by this. All right, because Aquino makes a very very good observation and um, analysis on the the truth of democracy right now i've talked about this previ previously so i'm not going to go too into it right now but the point that aquino makes is that the legitimacy or the virtue of a democracy assumes that all of its participants are um, willing and capable of making rational conscious decisions right but the issue with that is that most people, I mean, all of us aren't fully rational and aren't fully conscious of a lot of our decisions, but a lot of humanity, let's face it, is really completely unconscious of their own motivations, their own internal being. Um, you know, these are people that are easily swayed by, they're very suggestible, and we're all suggestible, to be clear, we're all suggestible. I'm aware of these feelings in myself. So I'm, I'm not trying to put myself up in a higher position. But I think we can also all agree that there are some people who are maybe a little more suggestible than others, you know, the kind of people who just see something and run with it. And, um, and the thing is that that's, that's even more hazardous now because there are forces that have learned how to use our suggestibility against us. Now, I'm just talking about the, the marketing industry. Um, but there are... Well, okay, because now we're getting into things that uh, kind of start teetering on like conspiracy theory. But look, there's been a lot of research throughout time. You start go back to like cybernetics, Norbert Wiener, all these things. Um, this is way back. I think Wiener started writing. He he got his ideas from World War II. I think he started writing about this stuff like in the 50s, if I'm not mistaken, but certainly at least by the 60s. But these uh, uh, these abilities to manipulate. Um, human beings on an individual and on a mass scale. This stuff is out there. If it, like, um, It's kind of actually kind of ridiculous that I feel like um, I might be making myself look like a nutter by talking about it because it's actual just factual truth that's out there. I mean, there are a whole divisions of a whole military divisions that are dedicated to researching and implementing these psychological manipulation techniques. And a lot of that stuff has spilled out. My personal view and full disclosure of the modern world is that there are various groups, both governmental and non-governmental, who have learned, who have learned these abilities to manipulate perception, and are implementing them all the time um, around us all the time. Now, this is not. I'm not. Um, I think some of it's probably silly and does, doesn't really accomplish anything, just like anything else, right? But I think it's being done, and I think it's part of the chaos that we're experiencing right now. You know, you have these different different bodies that can take take the underlying facts, spin narratives, direct them at certain portions of the population, and inspire those portions of the population to do fanatic things, but also just to sway how people vote, how people, um, what they say in public, you know, things like that. Um, I actually kind of think it's obvious that that is happening right now. Um, but who knows? Who knows? Maybe, maybe I'm hallucinating that. But either way, that's how I perceive uh, our current situation. And uh, that was a tangent that has now made me lose. Um, oh, we're talking about the uh, the nature of democracy and uh, the legitimacy of democracy. And so that was something that Aquino, or that the book says that really has me thinking, um, because that would actually take. All right, I like I assume many of you, probably most of you consider myself to be on a quest to fully understand my mind, my spirit, my soul, and my being. Um, I think of myself as a seeker. It's the old way of saying it. Uh, exploring human consciousness, being able to understand myself, I mean, on a profound level, understand how my mind functions. And um, that's always been considered kind of a personal spiritual quest, but perhaps it's time that we acknowledge or recognize that that is actually also necessary as a political quest um, for people to be able to make rational decisions on their own about very complex topics. Um, in order to do that, we have to be as clear as possible 
from our suggestible natures, right? I know that's a heavy thing, man. I talked about that before. I know that's it's idealistic. But anyway, and this, let's actually come back. Idealistic. So Aquino himself, I'm just going to say, Aquino himself in this book says <laughs> that um, the his mind war concept might be a little naive, to which I would actually agree. Um, I think that would surprise a lot of people. That was the, like the two big surprises that came out of, for me from the book. Number one, the fact that the book is not next level psychological operations. It actually goes out of its way to differentiate itself from psycholo uh, psychological operations and to even kind of criticize, um, condemn is probably too strong of a word, but, but kind of uh, psych traditional psychological operations. But the other surprising thing is that essentially the book is trying to pose an alternative to physical war, and the alternative that it, it poses is, to, it does strike me as kind of naive and even almost silly. But, um, but as a work in itself, I would also say that it's admirable and it's noble in its attempt to provide a, um, a non-harmful alternative to physical war. Basically, the book, the book is saying... Physical, like warfare is part of humanity. It always has been, it always will be. So let's do this mind war thing um, as a way to supplement or supplant physical war, right? And so, all right, and now we're getting to the tactical, the tactical part of how, how the book proposes this would actually happen. So when two groups, right, are getting together and they, they have, they have a difference that is inevitably going to push them to physical war. What the book proposes is that you would then send in this mind warfare team. And this mind warfare team, their primary objective would be resolving the dispute by coming to a, um, a mutually agreeable conclusion without physical war. Now, only when the mind war breaks down would the physical war begin, right? So the whole mind war campaign is an attempt to stop physical war while still coming to a um, satisfactory conclusion in a conflict between the people, and between the, the two groups. Um, now, in the process of doing that, this is what it, it strikes me as like kind of naive about it because... What is critical to the to the mind war concept is that everyone is fully conscious of this, right? So it wouldn't be like two groups coming together and we're going to try to manipulate each other and use these mind magic things on each other. They would come in and openly state, this is our position. The other group would say, this is our position. This, um, I think he calls it the Aristos. This outcome is what we want, right? And this would all be public, like they would, they would be stating this publicly to each other and it would be publicly I think he said that I think he said accessible but at least the public would at least be somewhat aware that this was happening and this is critical to his ethical and moral basis for this mind war idea that it, it gets away from not only the physical war but the manipulations the subconscious manipulations of psychological warfare right that that is where like it gets kind of like weird to me. That's why I keep reading it, trying to think like, is am I missing something here? Because what it seems to me is that you're basically it's like a like a debate, like um you're you you're having a debate between the two sides to um figure out which is the the best route, and that's where I feel like. I made this comment in, in the other another video I made about this. I, I keep reminding myself that this book was written for public consumption. I didn't like go through any weird I didn't like get this from the black market or something. I just bought it off Amazon, right? And so uh, I do consider maybe it's a possibility that Aquino was leaving some things out, some things that are only meant for the insiders, right? And um and also let me say, when I say things like that, uh Look, I'm a practical util I'm a practical person, right? I consider myself a pragmatist. And when I when I say these things, I uh, like a lot of people when they talk about these kind of, you know, mind manipulation type things, they automatically go to like evil, it's evil, it's evil. But dude, that that to say that is assuming that the person is operating in a vacuum or the the body is operating in a vacuum, but nobody's operating in a vacuum. So when you're living in a war, or living in a world where there's all kinds of people conducting these operations, 
you have to put that into context if your own body decides, well, we're going to do these operations as well, right? Like, it's not really fair to morally condemn actions outside of the context of the broader perspective. I've made this comment before about Reeve Whitson, the figure that emerged out of Chaos, the book by Tom O'Neill, um, who appears to have been Charles Manson's handler. And in the whole, um, that whole um, MK Ultra kind of related thing, um, that is actually, I, I understand this makes me unpopular with people, but that too has to be looked at in the context because the whole the whole operation of MK Ultra, at least initially, and I agree, maybe it has spun out of control and it, maybe it has been used for other purposes. But at least at one time, it was because it was part of the Cold War. You know, you had the Soviets were doing their um, manipulations and their own little social engineering games and their own little, you know, uh, sleight of hand tricks, and um, and so to to, in my opinion to give a fair and accurate analysis of that whole period of the MK Ultra and all of that things, you have to first ask your question, was there actually a Soviet, um, a, an effective Soviet campaign to take over America or to, to subvert America or, you know, to do whatever? And if it was, then those people, the people on our side deserve to be judged within that context, right? Because they were not operating in a vacuum. They had an opponent, and they were operating within the context of that game, right? Anyway, that's an aside. And these asides kill me because they, they make me lose my, my train of thought. But, um, because now I can't remember why I started this. But anyway, let's, let's go. So, in Aquino's, um, per, in Aquino's, um, suggestion for this Mind War campaign, all the be everybody would be fully aware of what was happening. But he does, this is a fascinating part of the book, because he does say there are some things that can be implemented, um, like some um, mental manipulations, not in necessarily a uh, evil sense. Um, there are some mental manipulations that can be applied to further rational debate, which I found really interesting. Like one thing he pointed out was that our sense of um, like claustrophobia um, or our sense of... Um, having our personal space invaded in is actually physically, scientifically um, correlated to temperature. And what, what, you mean, what he means by that, or the research that he points to by that, is if you put the same amount of people in the same room and you jack the temperature up, they're going to feel more uncomfortable and more like claustrophobic and, and tight with the people than they will if you put the same amount of people in the same room and you drop the temperature down. So temperature is correlated to our conception, our, our, our feeling, our emotional feeling of having people pressing in on us. Um, now I don't, maybe claustrophobia is not the right word for it, but that's how I think of it. I, I think you understand the concept that I'm giving. So that's interesting. So he just suggests things like that. Um, even, you know, this actually goes back to um, my comment about the suggestibility of human beings and how uh, we need to, in my opinion, we need to become more aware of our own suggestible and flawed nature because he also points out that um, apparently Hitler um, when he was you know I guess Hitler like kept a journalist or something I'm, I'm not into that history aspect of it and I, I actually find the obsession over the Nazis and Hitler to be a little little unhealthy um, I mean like the global obsession people who keeps researching it like at some point it's like I get it I get it I don't need to know that but anyway anyway so um, what he points to is apparently even Hitler had um, observed that the day the time of day that he gave a speech impacted the effectiveness of his speech and um, I forget what it was it was basically like if you catch people at a certain time of day as a whole, you're going to get more people who are tired and are not as receptive. And then other times, there, there's going to be times when they are more receptive. Now, see, people hear things about that and they just think, oh, well, that's an, that's an interesting little scientific tidbit, blah, blah, blah. But they're not thinking deeply about what that exactly means. Because we need to own that, man. We got to own that, dude. Because how rational is our, how rational is our final assessment of any given speech? if our assessment of that speech can be um, altered by the time of day that the speech was given, right? Those are the questions that, that were the, more than anything, it's not actually a core part of the book, but that's what I have walked away with, thinking about this, like thinking about, okay, how, 
how do we become better at democracy on an individual level? And it's all about here. Got to master this, man. And uh, if you're a person who, um, I believe we got to master this too. I, I do believe uh, human beings exist on multiple dimensions and have things that have been called souls. But whatever, you know, you can get away with that. Even if you're a, a more of a materialist, scientific materialist, meant. Um, on a purely psychological level, I think we can all agree that to be the best participants possible in democracy, we've got to master this thing, man. It, it's got to become an, uh, an imperative and a priority. But, uh, but anyway, again, my asides. So, all right. And so, in the actual physical impl implementation of this mind war campaign, to my understanding, you'd send in these teams, and these teams would come in to any given group, like say you have group X and groups of what, group Y, and... Um, they're they're about to they're about to fight war. We're talking war. We're not talking fisticuffs. We're talking war. Send in this mind war team, and they would go in and they would figure out which um, which of the participants are the key leaders, right? The ones that are going to have the most influence on the final outcome. And you would isolate them, not isolate them like an, like you would just say, okay, these are these are our chess pieces. These are the chess pieces that were taken out. These are the pieces that we're putting on the board. And then you would, it seems to me like you would have a debate, you know, <laughs> that's what I mean, the, the naivety, it's, like it's so weird to think of like the naivety of it, but, um, <clears throat> but beyond the debate, in, in the only like psychologically um, manipulative practices that he suggests are, are, suggests are permissible within the ethical framework of this mind war idea include things like the temperature of the room which is why i brought that up before i triggered that aside that i went on but um like um being mindful of the temperature of a room to make sure that all sides are as receptive as possible to a rational debate because if things are all heated up and people are all amped up and feeling claustrophobic that's going to actually lower their ability to rationally debate things. Um, there's also things he talks about, I think it was the EMT fields or something like that, the, the electromagnetic fields. Apparently that um, the, like the density of electromagnetic activity in an area has been shown according to the research that he cites in this, has been shown to affect human behavior as well. And so he suggests um, like, some some methods i think either pulling people away from those areas or I, apparently there's some t technical method to lower the impact of those electromagnetic fields and these are things produced by like power lines and stuff like that apparently he says that's correlated to um like higher rates of i think it was aggression or something like that basically it affects human behavior so that people aren't as um capable of having rational discussions and so those are the kind of things but even those um if if the mind war team implements those it has to be up front right they have to say like hey we're doing this the whole it's all about transparency and everybody knowing what's going on where and what's going on when and where right and so then this is the part that i keep reading the book and i i i don't know if i, I cannot find where he says this because so he says you go in you get you get these teams together and then they come to a conclusion right and then they go back to their, you know, the, the, the full bodies of whatever they're representing, say the state or the nation or the community or whatever. You know, he, he discusses this as working on like a tribal level as well. <clears throat> and, um, and so they would go back to those leaders. And then, you know, there's this part he describes. And so the way that it would look is that when the groups are out there, public, like the, um, the public facing officials would come out and say, we have reached a conclusion. And, you know, the public, wouldn't, would, nobody would really know, like, where did this conclusion come from? And then the mind war combatants fade into the, fade away, and they're supposed to be invisible. And, um, and their influence is supposed to have been irrelevant. You know, it's like the, the silent professionals, that's, that's what they call SF, special forces in, uh, in the army, they call them the silent professionals. It's supposed to be like the special operations community. It's a big thing <clears throat> um, that people don't brag and people don't take credit. And there's certain, I can say there's certain aspects of the special operations that um, respect that more than others, uh, to my experience. But anyway, and so, yeah, and so then the conclusion would be brought out to the public. Um, 
This is the part that I, I didn't understand because the whole book was going on and on about how you have to respect each the, the individuals within each body, right? So like every human being has inherent worth and their autonomy and their value should be respected and they should be engaged in this decision-making process. But my understanding when he talks about the tactical aspects of the book are that once this is decided the leaders come out and the leaders say this is our decision this is the policy we're going to and this policy is supposed to um, stop the physical war between the two groups and it's supposed to be the solution that um, is like a middle ground between the two groups and that they're both satisfied with and the book also stresses that the solution has to be long-term not sh not short-term right like they should be looking for a long-term solution to this problem how they can live together in harmony and in, in relative harmony right but what i don't understand is if that is the case and it seems to contradict earlier in the book when um when aquino writes that each individual should be fully conscious and fully aware of what's going on because then when he describes the actual implementation to, to my understanding it is then you know the decision is kind of made in the back room and then it's disseminated to the leaders and the leaders um make this public policy right but i don't fully understand that I, it seems to contradict the early part of the the book which i felt like was saying that every individual has a right to fully engage consciously in this debate and i felt like that was a contradiction but it's it's possible i'm not quite understanding it um i think because i've spent more time than i normally would need i mean i'm a relatively intelligent person and um i think he just didn't explain it well or he is contradicting himself um a slight contradiction it's not like a full-blown contradiction but there it kind of muddies what he's saying i feel like there's i feel like there's a, a muddiness there right and um that seems kind of strange to me and there's all there's also a couple other things in the book that seem like i said seem um, i don't have time to read this book for a hundred hours but i have read i've invested some time in, in into this and thinking about it and there are some things that do strike me as contradictory um, like one of the other things actually not from Aquino, but it's from the preface to the book which is written by a high-ranking military officer who's still serving i looked and um he he suggests that this this could be used um domestically to solve um internal uh philosophical political conflicts and um for for things such as um like globalization and global warming all this stuff and that is the thing that really confuses me because the way that that is discussed it sounds to me like it's mass social engineering um but yet the book goes through great lengths to separate itself from those kind of traditional ideas of psychological operations and psychological warfare in which which is i i as an outsider this isn't like my specialty or anything seems to me like social engineering is part of that world right and so i i don't understand that i feel like it kind of contradicts itself or that the author held back on some things that are more just for insiders because this is a public facing book and um, maybe wanted to leave some of that stuff out. Um, I don't know. I, I'm thinking about this. Um, I have so much going on. I can't. I can't, I can't make it uh, my life's work to try to, to try to fully grasp this this thing. So I decided it's time to make this video. I've got to get this out of my mind. I feel like I got what is important to me to get out of it. And um, and like I said, I, I'm, in a minute I'm going to talk about the the new series that I want to do on this channel, inspired by this book. Um, so I, I feel like there are some things that are contradictions in the book, but it could simply be that the book was not um, optimally written, or it could be that I'm just too thick-headed to get it. I don't know, man. Um, my natural assumption is always, I just must not be getting anything. Um, but after digging through this and digging through this and writing notes and thinking about it, I don't, I don't think that's the case. I think the book is not adequately explaining a couple aspects of things, and I think there are contradictions in the book um which is not i mean that shouldn't that doesn't that's not a denouncement of the value of the ideas in the book entirely i'm just saying i think there are some things that 
don't quite line up and don't quite make sense and um, would need to be clarified. Uh, or it's always, I mean, it's possible, as, as I mentioned, I don't think this is true, but in the spirit of objective consideration, it is also possible that the author knew, hey, the author and all the people who contributed this book knew, hey, this is going to be for public consumption. So we're straight up going to like manipulate, like a limited hangout kind of thing. Like we're going to throw this out there and let people know about it. But we're going to kind of like massage some things so it takes away the edge of it, right? That's possible. That's possible. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. But it's a very... The book is inter- it's, it's a it's a worthwhile read. I would suggest it for people um, without a doubt if you have an interest in such things. Um, the implementation the concept to me it does seem um, well the, it does seem a little naive to me, uh, but just because it seems that way. And what I mean by naive is like I don't know. Can we really reroute the human impulse to um, conflict into such a uh, touchy feely. I I don't know, I don't know, but it, it definitely. It's either way. It's very worthwhile. Um, it's very thought provoking and very interesting. Um, but anyway, and so, like I said, the big thing that I came away from it is just thinking about the connection between our individual human consciousness and um, and democracy, right? And um, I. I really want to make democracy work. I assume you all agree, right? Um, but I think making democracy work may be a bigger bigger undertaking than people realize. But that's okay. We're human beings, man. Human beings always overcome, adapt and overcome. And um, I would also say to those people who, who th- think like... Um, well, part of my freedom is the right to not engage in these things. Like, I'm a, if I'm a free person, if I'm a free man, then I am free to not engage in these things, right? And to not have to understand my mind and all of this stuff. To which I would say, you know, there's that saying, to live, a lot, to live above the law, you must be honest. And that's actually a very deep, deep um, thought. And I think it's very true to something in human nature, um, but maybe even the metaphysical nature of the universe. I, I actually do believe it's something in the metaphysical nature of the universe, but again, hey man, we're all a scientific materialist. I hope that you can sit here and we can have a discussion because I'm, I'm open to that, man. I just, I happen to believe that there is something more than just, um, wind up biological machinery to the human being and to life in general. I, I believe this is a universe of, Consciousness, but anyway, getting into that, uh, getting into another topic there. So, and, and so I would say to those people, it seems kind of paradoxical, but it's just like um, being disciplined, right? People think, oh, that's so much work, and it it's, um, it takes away my uh, spontaneity, but it actually doesn't, right? I mean, um, anybody who has experienced it, and there's been people who have talked about this as as an open philosophy. It seems paradoxical, but the more you discipline yourself, the more free you become because the the less enslaved you are to your um, impulses and to your irrational decisions and to repetitive destructive behaviors. Um, all of those subconscious little demons that are in our heads, you know, you can discipline yourself to be a little more free of them. And so it seems paradoxical, but self-discipline actually makes you more free, right? And I also believe that a um, the the better that people can and do conduct themselves, the less justification there is for laws to control those people. To me, that's the real way to freedom, uh, to to meaningful freedom, and to an effective democracy. Just my opinions. I'm just some dude. But those are just my opinions, and um, and so. The series that I'm going to begin in this, uh, I'm not exactly sure what I'm going to call it, but um, what I want to do is uh, like maybe once a week or something I'm going to do this because uh, I want to take the time to fully research things before I do the videos. I don't want to just get up and like talk a cursory cursory overview of things. I want to really research them. And so maybe one once a week do uh, I'll do a video where I highlight a a human um, 
blind spot, a psychological blind spot, uh, emotional or psychological blind spot that is used against people to manipulate them. And these are all over the place. Like I actually, I studied hypnotism for a while and you'd be shocked at how easy it is to actually manipulate people. Um, I mean, this guy, uh, the courses that I was taking, he, he did a couple of things that were, I mean, it's simple, right? It's simple. We are actually very easy to, to manipulate. I know none of us likes to think that. We all like to think that we're fortresses and that we're all, we all make our own decisions, but that's not true. It's simply not true. And, um, but we could get better at it, right? And, and I'm going to start a series where once a week we'll explore one aspect of our own minds that is openly open to suggestibility and is manipulative easy to manipulate and um and then figure out ways to um counteract the potential manipulation against our minds and um i think in a lot of times it's simply becoming conscious of it right simply understanding i mean like one of the simplest one of the simplest ways that uh, p uh, public perception is manipulated is simply through rep repetition of phrases you know you, did you know that? Did you know that? that that's um, that's it. Like if you can just get um, leaders and uh, like news outlets and stuff to repeat a certain phrase enough times, it gets lodged in people's minds, and um, that's it. But that simple little thing, right? So just becoming conscious of that and just realizing, wait, if I start seeing a term that is seems to be saying, being said over and over and over again, that doesn't necessarily mean that the core behind the term is wrong maybe it's maybe it's still a good concept but it does help to become conscious of the fact that the mere repetition is being used to alter your mind right those are the simple things that we can become open to and look out for and um, make ourselves more conscious beings right and um, at this point uh, I personally believe we got to go that way there's I don't want to get into this because there's a lot of things that people will be able to write off as, um, yeah. I personally believe that we are at a point where our political uh, traditions are in serious threat and maybe justifiably so because if we, if we as Americans, as democracy loving people, if we can't rise to the challenge, right, and say, okay, these forces are being used to manipulate us. I'm going to get better. I'm going to get better. I'm going to make myself more conscious. I'm going to make myself a stronger participant in this world. If we can't rise up and say that, well, then maybe we don't deserve democracy. Maybe we never deserve democracy. Nobody wants to hear that. But sorry, man. Um, that is kind of my feelings on it. Like, if you can't take a little bit of time to not only study the political aspects of things and to come to your own conclusions, but to also learn how to think and um, clear your perceptions to the best limit possible. If you're not willing to make that sacrifice for the freedom of being able to choose your leaders, then maybe maybe we don't deserve it to begin with, right? And that's just, just the way it is, man. Um, our freedom is a gift. And um, if we're not willing to reroute our entire lives, if necessary, to um, ensure that freedom then maybe we don't deserve it right so uh, that's just the way i see it but anyway that's a series i want to start doing um it'll be easy for me to do because i have a whole library of books on these kind of these kind of things and it's something that has fascinated me for a long time and so you know i'm sick of in circles there's so much defeatism and there's so much you know oh they're doing this to manipulate us well fine let's learn let's learn how things are manipulated let's learn how people are manipulated and let's find proactive actionable steps to make sure that we, um, man, my light's going crazy. I, the, I, right next to me is a big old window. And um, as the sun comes through in, in these early morning hours, it like makes the, the lighting, I think the camera has a hard time um, doing its little digital adjustments to the lighting. And uh, yeah, right now I'm, I'm in shadows, which maybe that's suitable, right? Like I'm in shadows. I'm a shadow figure, man, and uh, talking about all this crazy shit, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I don't know, man, that's the series that I want to do, and uh, I think it's worthwhile and useful, and I think it's uh, important for us, but anyway, <laughs> that being said, ultimately, Mind War, a very thought-provoking book, I would highly recommend reading it, um, 
I most appreciated the ethical uh, and psychological um, analysis and criticism of psychological warfare and of physical warfare. Um, there's a lot of fascinating tidbits in there about um, little things, like I said, little environmental factors that can alter your ability to think rationally. I think that's very useful stuff. The actual implementation of it, like I said, I feel like the book could have used, um, I feel like the book could be improved uh, to explain exactly how the implementation, like really fundamentally how that would actually play out. But it is possible that I'm just not quite understanding something. Or it is further possible, like I said, that because the book was written for public consumption, some aspects of it were kept a little quiet. So, I don't know, whatever it is, I still, it's a very interesting book. I would recommend reading it. And um, again, I a lot of people have very strong uh, feelings about Aquino. I don't, I don't see how that matters to the book itself, right? Like, you can read a, a, some literature, philosophy, or anything from a person and separate it from the person, right? And so it's clear by the, by the other figures that have contributed to this book that Aquino was on some level influential. Like, these ideas, they made it into the system. They were being discussed. They were being debated. And so if we're trying to understand our world and we're trying to understand these facets of the, the military and of life, then um, the book can, and in my opinion, should be read as a standalone item that is um, completely separate from the uh, virtues or vices of its author, whatever those virtues or vices might be. So anyway, bam, that's it. Uh, yeah, a lot of thoughts from this book. Um, I talked longer than I expected. There's probably nobody listening right now. But yeah, those are my thoughts on the book, man. It's uh, interesting stuff and has given me a lot to think about. And I will be reading, I think there's a couple other books that are associated um, with this book or with this concept anyway. And I'm going to read those and, and try to further my understanding of this whole thing. And if anybody happens to stumble upon this and can fill in the blanks, the, the gaps that I have in my understanding, and I would appreciate hearing them, because I, I do want to understand exactly how it would actually be played out on the ground. I feel like the book is vague in describing that, and I would be interested to know. But all right, that's it, and uh, thank you for your time, everybody. Peace out, 2022. I hope you are uh, pursuing your goals, living happy, living healthy, and uh, getting out there and not letting the negativity get you down, man. Positivity and... Um, confidence they are the resistance they are the rebellion against any given any given uh negative influence right don't let them get you down don't let them fill you with so much fear and panic that you um give up on your own goals because uh that's no good man we gotta have goals we have to believe in ourselves and uh, even when the future is very unsteady and very unclear and very scary we have to find that thing within ourselves for our own good, for our own good. You don't want to give in to that fear. You don't want to give in to the hysteria. And I'm talking right now just about the general madness of the world that we're in right now, right? The world's been crazy for the last, like, what, five, six, seven, eight years, whatever. So, yeah. All right. Peace out, everybody. Bye.